Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Dinner in Depth. My name is Bonnie Bright, and I'm your host, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is a free online community for everyone who's interested in depth and Jungian psychologies, and that's at www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. I'm here with my guest today, Hadley Fitzgerald, who is both an astrologer and a psychotherapist. Hadley, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Bonnie. I am just so happy to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you because we haven't done a lot of these kinds of discussions on astrology. And, of course, you have a very unique take on this because you are really combining astrology and psychotherapy in ways that I think are not that common in the history of, of psychology, traditional psychology particularly. Uh, and as you know, I'm partial to depth psychology, and of course a lot of our listeners will be as well. Um, let me just tell everybody a little bit about Hadley before we jump in. Hadley, and then I'm just chomping at the bit to get into this discussion with you. Of course, we'll also be talking about your recent book, Images of Soul, Reimagining Astrology. So I'm excited to get into that as well. So Hadley is a licensed psychotherapist who has been actually licensed almost as long as she's been an astrologer. And she received her MA in 1979 and then her marriage and family therapy license in 1981. So she has a long history of doing both of these fields and has really become an expert. She's also published numerous articles and has been a freelance writer for more than 25 years. And uh, Hadley, I was also really excited to see that you have a certificate of training in eco-psychology, which is very near and dear to my heart and I also believe falls um, very solidly under the umbrella of depth psychology. So again, thank you for being here with me. Let's just jump into this. Maybe you can start out by talking about the book a little bit because this is something that is new for you. And you co-published this, by the way, with your colleague of a long time, Judith Hart. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you guys came to publish this book together because you sort of have had, as I understand, parallel careers. We have. You know, I was I was thinking about this. I had an epiphany in 1974. I can really look back at this. And in which I got that astrology would become an essential component of the psychology and the psychotherapy of the future. Um, in her dissertation in the 1980s, Judy traced the progression of astrology itself becoming more psychological. And so when James Hillman put forth his acorn theory in 1996 in the soul's code. I knew immediately he was talking about the natal chart and the soul's evolution from acorn to oak tree, if you will. And from another angle, Judy was seeing his ideas on images of the psyche as an actual picture of the horoscope. So when I've looked back on this, um, and, and I just had this thought recently, we refer very specifically to the acorn theory in, in the book. And I've come to realize that Images of Soul itself, the book, is an excellent illustration of the acorn theory. We can see it as an acorn. Uh, it has a diamond all its own. And that that diamond was planted a long time ago. Even before I moved back east and before Judy began working on her dissertation, my moving back east generated these letters between us because we had lived basically about 12 miles from each other for ages. And um, I took a job as I was hired uh, to work in a residential treatment facility for troubled adolescents as an astrologer and a family systems analyst in 1987. And so that's where the book began. The letters that were generated between us, they were typewritten letters that we exchanged over the course of time. And Judy began working on her dissertation. And so I, I've looked back and said, okay, that was the acorn for the book, those letters. There's a consciousness in the book itself. And then about three months ago, I was cleaning out some old files, and I found an old typewritten lecture that I had given it was entitled Astrology in Your Imagination. The lecture itself doesn't have a date on it, but I can tell from the references in the talk that it was about 1977. Um, I've written across the top of the lecture, Phoenix, Friday night, in pencil, but I don't remember if that referred to Phoenix, Arizona, or the Phoenix bookstore in Santa Monica. 
I was a year into graduate school where I intended to find a way to integrate astrology with the practice of psychotherapy. And in that talk, I make an early case for the value of doing that. So this is a bit of a long story, but I think it's really germane to how the book has a life of its own, and we are the servants of bringing it into the world. To my amazement, as I read this typewritten lecture I'd done in 77, I very quickly said to this particular audience, and this is a quote from me, when I first began to study and work with images, I saw some very interesting correlations between a person's images and the astrological configurations in his or her horoscope. Uh, in 1975, I had taken a fascinating UCLA extension course called Psychoimagination Therapy with Dr. Joseph Shore, and I was using the imaging exercises he taught us in order to go more deeply into my astrological sessions with certain clients at the time. I was not yet a therapist. Um, and then, you know, as I got into graduate school, the demands of graduate school, various personal challenges, changes in my life, and so forth, really interfered with the deeper development of that work. But the rediscovery of this old yellowed copy of that lecture, which I'd totally forgotten about, just a few months after Images of Soul Reimagining Astrology was published, seemed to me a marvelous synchronicity, as if it, like the, the daimon, the, the acorn of the book itself, was confirming that it had a life of its own. It had an acorn all of its own that was meant to grow in its own time. And Judy and I are the gardeners, you know, we're the attendants to its growth and development. And then in 1987, my diamond, my acorn, took me back east, which was the genesis of the letters. And Judy's diamond, her acorn, had her pursuing her Ph.D. and the subsequent dissertation that used those letters. And I don't know, I just look at the perfection of it all, and I'm quite amazed. You know, that that's a great story. And, of course, you mentioned this word a couple of times, daimon, which I mm -hmm. presume that a lot of our listeners will know what that refers to, particularly because they will be familiar with Stillman's work. But can you just, for, for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with it, explain what that is and, and how that relates to the book having the, the life of its own? Well, it, boy, that is just a tough term. And as we know, it's been really corrupted into demon and, you know, all of the negative associations that have somehow morphed uh, over the years. But the daimon, as I see it, not an original thought of mine by any stretch, it's this this central core essence of self, a calling. I was raised Roman Catholic or Irish Catholic, actually. And so, you know, we were told we had a guardian angel that came in uh, to the world with us and accompanied us, mm -hmm. and which I think is basically a riff on... Uh, older beliefs about a, a genie, a, a genius, a particular unique entity that comes in with the soul when it's born and, in my image anyway, holds a scroll in its hand and says, by the way, remember this, this is what you're here doing in this lifetime on the earth right now. Um, and so the daimon is that, that just that core place in the self that is totally unique, it has work to do in the world that, as an astrologer, I can say it shows up in the chart. This is your diamond. We are looking at what you brought in, what you've contracted to do, if one can you know, use that, uh, that image there. It's something that's all your own, regardless of all the overlay of the culture and the family and all of the, the tyranny of the shoulds and the censoring and just all the overlay that the culture puts on people that says this is who you are. Uh, Castaneda, I think it was Castaneda, who said we are given an interpretation of reality when we're born. Hmm. And uh, that that's true. You know, you look around, these are grown-ups. They can get their own glasses of water. They can reach doorknobs. They can drive cars. They can do these amazing things. They're huge. And they tell us how the world works. They show us mm -hmm. how the world works. And the daimon inside is looking at all of that and saying, well, maybe. Well, I don't know. Really? Seriously? And, um, you know, that's kind of a roundabout way of explaining it, but I don't want to, I don't want to make it into a thing. You yeah, know, I'm yeah. I, I thing. understand what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's definitely not a thing. <laughs> and I and I think anybody who has uh, some concept of depth psychology probably would have that same resistance because it's it's very much not a thing. 
Uh, at the same time, maybe what we could say it is is on some level an image, and of course images are so important in both the book Images of Soul, and uh, yeah. of course also the work of astrology and particularly archetypal astrology. Uh, there's a couple of images that you mentioned that just came up for me, which I just want to articulate them and maybe speak them. And we don't necessarily have to go into them, but uh, because I want to talk more about images, I'll say this. One is it's really interesting that you you wrote down, you said, on that lecture that you found, Phoenix, Friday night, and yeah. you mentioned that you didn't yeah. know if it was referring to the city or the bookstore, but what if it was referring to the image of a phoenix, you know, this rising Absolutely. from the ashes? <laughs> so that on. was on. really interesting. I, I like that. And then, of course, this whole image of the, the guardian angel meaning the genie or the genius that is here to remind us what we're here for. I I think that's also a really beautiful image. So speaking of that, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the power of images in astrology and and how you work with them. Sure. Well, it's evolved over the years. It went into a dance for a while and, and is now very much back. I'm a certified therapy practitioner. This is Lauren Schneider's creation. She's a wonderful therapist in Westlake, um, developed a whole system over decades of, of her own personal work with images. Where And, and this is where Judy and I are, are different. She does some, some of the images from, she accesses them in a different way. And I, I don't have that particular access. The images don't present themselves to me as regularly as I think they do for her. But I found a way to open the gate so that they mm-hmm. come in more often. And it's using this therapy system. And it involves using images from many, many different sources. Um, and as soon as you say tarot, it's like saying astrology. You know, oh, tarot decks, the Rider weight deck, or there are hundreds of decks now, maybe even thousands for all I know. But mm-hmm. but this is not about tarot readings at all. It's not about predicting anything at all. It is about um, ha- a basket of probably two dozen tarot decks. And I just sit with someone and I ask them to look through the decks and they might look at one or two or five or however many decks they want to look at and just see which one resonates with them. Uh, Every deck has its own aesthetic. That's psyche at work, too. So the psyche is now, as I see it, in dialogue. It it is ready to present the client and myself with an image or a series of images that will address something that's going on in this person's life. um, Those are two different ways I work. And so we we look at it from that point of view. What I see it doing is it enables people to see and say things that are true that they just couldn't say or maybe even access in any other way. I've just seen this proved over and over and over again. So, and I can go back and, and talk about this a little more. When I'm working pretty exclusively with a horoscope, with a birth chart, I've I've got a number of things I can do. And the tarot cards, of course, involve archetypal images. These are all archetypes that we're looking at, particularly in the major arcana. And I take those archetypal energies. I have a huge chart wheel that I bring out. And I can take these archetypal images and put them around in someone's chart and give them a visual representation of the archetypes, how they're working in the chart and how they're relating to one another. Mm, that's great. And it imprints in a very different way on the psyche. Because a lot, and I, when I do an astrological session with someone, I never use jargon. I never talk about your Mars or your Saturn or anything because I think it's very obfuscating. It's an arcane language to so many people. And they're really, I'm, I'm interested in how is astrology useful in someone's life. How, how do you take what we talk about and apply it to your life? It's not me reading something to you or at you, you know. And so I've, I've worked very conscientiously with that over all these years. But now with the images, I can show someone, uh, and then they can report to me how it feels to them to see those images depicting their chart for them. That's the astrological part. It really brings it alive. It's, it's, it's a fascinating way of deepening my own process and my clients' processes, you know, in a mutual way. And 
Most of all, I've learned never to ignore an image whenever and however it appears, whether that's in my therapy work or my astrological work. I just did a, a session with a client on Skype, and it was interesting. I've worked with him astrologically over several years. We kind of do intermittent sessions. We do annual updates and all of that. And um, he said, you know, we're in between sessions, and I but there's some stuff coming up, and I'd really like to see if we can do some image work on Skype with this. And I said, hey, you know, let's go for it. And um, he had been working with one particular deck, and he was just not happy with it, or he couldn't relate to it or whatever. And I had had this feeling just before I Skyped with him that there was another deck that, I, I don't know why I felt this. To, and to me, this is psyche talking. Mm-hmm. I, I just felt, I think, I just I just want to show him this other deck because I'm very fond of the deck he's been using. And I showed it to him, and he just like heaved this huge sigh of relief. And he had been working with two particular archetypes, and they were very troubling to him. And when I showed him the versions of those archetypes in this other deck I was using, he said, that's it. That's Mm. exactly it. Mm. And so different decks give us a different understanding Mm -hmm. of the archetypes that I trust Psyche wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're saying I think maybe the image is portrayed in a a different way that just somehow speaks to the person's psyche in a way that the other image didn't necessarily touch in on. It, It might be a kind of resonance if you want to look at it that way. Exactly so, and and clients will pick a deck that I don't work with very much at all, but they love it, and I have a deck that I love, and a client will look at it and say, no, no, not for me, mm-hmm. and and it's just it's that's a study in itself, but but mainly that that there's an interaction with the images, and I can give you another example of a therapy client that I've worked with for a long time. She comes in for her session, and um, I'm very familiar with her issues. She's a therapist. Uh, very, works very conscientiously in therapy all the time, very up on her material and, and wanting to process it. And she came and said, I don't know, she said, there's something just, there's just something else going on here that's coming up, feels like old stuff, I can't believe this old stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, let's just work with uh, images today. And um, so we sat down on the floor and she picked a deck and and one of the ways I do this is I say, okay, so is there a question? can't be a yes or no kind of thing, but what's the issue? What are you looking at? And and then how many cards do you need? How many images do you need to see to help you with this? How are they laid out? All this is face down, and she picks the cards after she's picked the deck. And then I say, and so what part of the issue is this card, this card, this card, this card going to help you look at and people know they just know they know how many cards they need whether it's one or five or six they just know Mm -hmm. you're saying some part of them knows it may not be the ego self or the conscious self that oh i don't think the ego's there at all yeah exactly Uh so exactly so and as she pulled these she just pulled four cards and as she turned them over she said and i don't want to do any personal disclosure i'm going to protect her here but as she turned the card two of the four cards Immediately she said, "Oh my God, yes! Oh my God, there it is! There it is! I'm, I'm, yeah. yep, I'm back down in there, you know." Yeah. So that yeah. that's really the power of images to bring consciousness yep. around the, you know, it's it's manifesting whatever is unconscious and bringing it to our awareness, so that we can then begin to identify what sort of narrative we're we're already in the midst of, whether we know it or not. Exactly, and then I could also relate it to where she is astrologically. You know, why is this, let's look at how this is coming up now in the archetypal world of astrology. And that's very rich, too. And as I'm imagining Judy would say, too, this isn't appropriate work for everyone, Uh clinically speaking. We have to be very discerning, never foist it on anybody or pressure anybody. I don't pressure anyone to accept astrology. I see people that just want therapy. That's what they want. And right. I can do therapy. Those are those are all ethical concerns too. 
Yes, I, I can imagine. I mean, it, it can be quite controversial, and, and particularly, again, in the in the traditional field of psychology, which uh, has gone, for many of us particularly that are really more leaning toward depth psychology, the traditional field of psychology can be uh, lacking soul, so to speak. And so, well, I, so it, I find... Yeah, Hillman, you know, I'm sorry, Hillman had that great quote. He said, I, I, I'm not sure the psyche is taught in psychology. The ology has captured the psyche. The logos has captured the psyche, and it's become a system. Right. Yeah, which which is so profound when you really start to, to deconstruct that statement and, and realize the the impact of what that means for all of us who are living in a, a time and a culture where we need more than ever this kind of understanding and, and connection or reconnection with that part of ourselves or with soul or with the collective soul or the anima mundi, whatever term you choose to use. It's so important. And and the image is really such a powerful link. And also I have clients whose therapeutic process I've guided over the years, they don't want to know about astrology. The idea of working with tarot images, that's not part of their belief system. So I'm I'm guiding the therapy with my astrological understanding very often, you know. But it's helped me. I always think of one client in particular uh, being at the vanguard of this many, many, many years ago. I was able to get accurate birth information for her. And she worked so hard in therapy and just showed up regularly. She worked with her issues. She was very, very dedicated to the whole process, but I was not going to talk to her about astrology or anything uh, like that. But I did have her chart. And one of the gifts of having it was seeing the number of cyclical changes she was going to be going through for a long period of time. It just so happened. And someone without astrology might have looked and said, my God, why is this taking her so long? <laughs> you know, what? She, she works so hard. Why, why is she, why does she seem so stuck so often? She wasn't stuck. She was going through these absolutely profoundly deep archetypal gear shifts if that's not some kind of a strange expression, having to just work her way into this enormous transformation over about a five-year period. And then when it played itself out, she changed her life. And so I was not impatient. I wasn't wondering. I wasn't questioning. I just said, it's her acorn. The oak tree is growing slowly but surely here, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So that's one of the yeah. gifts of having astrology as backdrop, and I never needed to say anything to her about it, you know. Right. Yeah, it, because it provides you the context as as the therapist in order to be able to understand what's happening. Do, do you think, you know, Hadley, this is such a it's such a fascinating combination of fields. This whole astrological psychology or maybe a psychological astrology, I'm not sure which, but it seems like really it's kind of even at the margins of depth psychology because there's just not that many people doing it that I'm aware of. But maybe maybe it's just that I'm not aware. Do you know if there are other therapists, a lot of other therapists who use astrology in their work, either well, with clients are... or in the background, that, like you mentioned? Yeah, I think there there are uh, there are a lot of closeted astrologers <laughs> or therapists who are closeted astrologers. You know, that's the rumor has it. I did a, I think, was the first person granted a dispensation to do um, a, a two unit continuing education course for the local branch of uh, California Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. There's a state organization, and then they have local chapters, and so this is. Two years ago, yeah, I think it was two years ago, um, I proposed, I said I wanted to offer a, a very elementary workshop in astrological symbolism for licensed therapists and interns to just take a look at this. And they they got permission to grant CEUs for the workshop. And it was an interesting experience because the workshop sold out in 24 hours. Wow. And... We had about 25 people there, I think, something like that, interns as well as licensed people. And, you know, you speak for an hour and present and show things and so forth for an hour, and then there's supposed to be a break and then come back for an hour. They didn't want to take a break, so we just kind of roamed around. People ate stuff and drank stuff and just kept talking. And then um, I ended up going 20 minutes beyond the two hours because Mm -hmm. there was interest and I, I look back 
at when this seed got planted for me in 1974, sitting with a client one day, a, an astrology client, and I'll never forget, I can remember where I was sitting, I remember where she was sitting, and whatever it was I saw in her chart and said to her, and I've written about this as well, she, she burst into tears. And I thought, oh, my God, I don't know what to do right now. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't feel qualified to give her advice. I don't, I, you know. So that got me thinking, oh, maybe she needs to see a therapist. So I got a list of you know, like three therapists. I hope you can go. And I thought I better have this for clients to go see. And I did that for a while, and then I had my own epiphany in in 74 when I thought, no, this is the wave of the future for psychology and for Mm -hmm. psychotherapy. And I think it was Rick Tarnas. I don't think it was Rick Tarnas. It was Rick Tarnas. I'm not sure I'm quoting him exactly accurately, but he said something along the lines of uh, psychologists, psychotherapists of the future will look back on those who did therapy without astrology the way we now would look back on astronomers of ancient times trying to do astronomy without a telescope. Mm-hmm. And yes, so, I've heard that. Before. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not doing justice to his actual words, but, but that was my feeling in 74. And, and, and of course, when I talked with Judy about it, she obviously got it too and, and went on to pursue it with her, with her dissertation. I, I, I did a dissertation on astrology and family systems. I had to get permission to do that. But um, it's still, it's got that um, sun sign newspaper stuff to it. And I just heard Michael Shermer, you know, the editor of Skeptic Magazine, talking, doing a TED Talk and talking about, you know, people will believe anything. They believe astrologers. They believe psychics. They believe palm readers because they want to and basically saying this is fake this is playing on your susceptibility etc cetera, etc cetera. and i just over and over and over again want to say have you ever had your chart done by a qualified astrologer mm-hmm. have you yeah ever? it seems like it, you know i mean again there's a lot of misconceptions out there and and a lot of just the cultural framework, unfortunately, which we live in, which is not open to so many of these things that can actually allow us to access the unconscious and understand more what is being asked of us in in our lifetimes and what kind of work we should all be doing in the world, whether it's paid career or whether it's just a work of individuation and becoming more conscious and and helping those around us also raise their own consciousness. It seems like the, it's interesting because the subtitle of your book is Reimagining Astrology. Mm-hmm. But it seems like what you're talking about in all of this is that it's also necessary for us on some level to reimagine psychotherapy as well. Exactly so. I couldn't agree more. It, it's Language grants us access to the realm it describes. So astrology, mythology is the the language of a dynamic relationship between interior lives and the collective. You know, it's like a call and response with the world. And the the planets, these planetary archetypes, represent living qualities of intelligence that reside within us and connect with us and, and connect us to really all of creation, all of the world. And and so psychology has been so shrunk to uh, techniques and get in, get out, solve the problem, case management, all of that. And it's such a such a disservice to the soul. And we, we have to, well, depth psychology devoted to the deepening of psychology. I think was, Hillman said something along the lines of uh, we get very focused on growth in psychology, and he was interested in depth not growth, because as he pointed out, after a certain age, you don't grow. If you start growing, it becomes cancer, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So so how do we we're, – we're in some kind of major transitional time for looking at all of the structures, all of them, in our society. And astrology still has many people who practice it in that old fatalistic – I call it the black hole of Calcutta mentality – you know, oh my God, you've got this conjunct that in the fern of your tree, and you're doomed. You know, <laughs> and, and then they do that power trip thing, and uh, and and I've certainly had over the years colleagues send me clients that they are working with who have been really frightened by astrologers. It doesn't happen so much anymore, 
but they've been told something that time and again I've been able to say to somebody, I'm sorry, that is not visible in a horoscope. You cannot look at a horoscope and be told you will never have children, you will have five children, you will be married three times. That information is not available in a horoscope. It's not. And that's and counter so, to what a lot of people actually believe in the in the general population. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, and one of the cases I use that I'm so fond of is was a therapy client who also knew, you know, I did some astrological work with her as well. But I'd worked with her for quite a good while, and she moved away. She met a lovely man. She got married and a little bit later in life, but still wanting to have one or two children. And she called me after the wedding, and she was very, very upset. She was like solid Rock of Gibraltar kind of person, and she was very upset. Someone had given her as a wedding gift uh, an astrological reading by an astrologer who never talked to her, who did the reading on tape, and and this well-intentioned friend gave it to her as a wedding gift. And in this reading, on tape, not in a conversation, I never do a chart without a conversation with somebody, um, uh, the astrologer said to her, I understand this is a wedding gift and you're recently just gotten married, um, and I, I hope you're not planning on having children because the area of your chart that is related to having children is full of a great deal of trouble. And um, and if you go ahead and do that and, and get pregnant, the child will bring great sorrow into your life. I, I mean, it just makes me want to wow. scream. Yeah, there's so much harm that's done by that. And, of course, again, it's those kinds of practices and statements that get proliferated, stories that get proliferated out and and end up giving astrology and other, by the way, esoteric practices, really the, the bad rap that they tend to yes. get. Because people are not looking at the depth psychological aspects of it. They're not looking at the archetypal aspects. They're not looking at the evolutionary aspects. And so it, it becomes, uh, there's a lot of talk in depth psychology about rituals and how rituals, how, instead of being living rituals that actually summon a, a different way of being, a different state, uh, a, a different type of energy, they be, have become rites, which are more fixed and um, begin to yes. become so fixed that they lack the, the living power that has been traditionally associated with them. And I see that with psychology as well. You guys mentioned in the book uh, evolutionary astrology. Is that related yes. to that? How, how does that come in? Well, yes. And let me also, if I can PS on that story I just told you about my client, um, I am happy to say because I could do I could do a course correction for her by looking at her chart. I said actually, given the things that are going on in your chart right now, um, I really wouldn't be concerned. She has now a beautiful, brilliant 16-year-old boy who has been the joy of her and her husband's life. Wow! So yeah, I want to point that point. out too. <laughs> yeah, you thank know, you for adding um, that. Yeah, yeah I, I really want to add that because, and I wasn't sugarcoating anything for her. I, I just needed to reassure her that you just can't see such a thing. So ask me your question again, Bonnie. I'm sorry. I was just uh, asking you, you mentioned in the book evolutionary astrology, and I wondered if yeah. you would just say more about that. Evolutionary astrology is, it's, you know, another division, another branch of astrology. There are a couple of major proponents of it in, in the field. My particular leaning is towards Stephen Forrest, who is an old and dear friend and quite brilliant. And the other proponent, it's a slightly different school, slightly different approach, is Jeffrey Wolf Green. Uh, both have very wonderful people doing, doing the work. Evolutionary astrology does consider that there are lifetimes prior to this one. Now, up until about, even, even after Stephen was starting to do this work, I kind of eh, danced around it and I said, you know, we got enough stuff to think about in this one lifetime, let alone looking at other lifetimes and mm-hmm. and I never wanted to really look at uh past life material because my reasoning, my my left brain said, well, I mean, I don't know what your name was. I don't know where your bodies are buried. I don't know what time you lived in and all of that. So what's the point of talking about past lives? Let's just focus on this one. And and indeed, that is that is the focus for evolutionary astrologers. However, there is a way of looking at charts if people are open to this. And again, it's something I don't foist on anyone. I just say, does the idea of reincarnation make sense to you? And I would say at this time in my professional life, most clients will say, oh, yeah, absolutely. But if not, 
I don't go there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's a way of looking at the chart, and and I do work slightly differently from what Stephen teaches. I'm a little less detailed, a little more summarizing around it, and and imagining. And I use this term in the book. We, what we do is we look at certain archetypal configurations, which are more prominent for some people than for others, for sure, and say, ah, looks to me like there's some unfinished business from another time here that you're still working on. And one of the things that I've seen show up is trauma. And God knows history is so full of trauma. We've now got some idea of how much there is because we can do more investigation than we ever could before. But, you know, so much of it is just lost. There's massive trauma, pestilence, famine, plague, war. People have done dreadful things to one another. And then just the whole issue of survival over the course of history has been fraught with difficulty. And so when you look at certain configurations, you say, ah, it looks to me, for example, like, and I'm, I'm just about to do a chart for someone where there is some great work that she was on the verge of completing, it seems to me, I have to say it seems to me, uh, in another lifetime or perhaps more than one. And as she exited that lifetime, uh, that great work got cut short by something. And so she's come back in with that as part of her contract, that she wants to finish She wants to accomplish some kind of great work, capital G, capital W, in very Jungian terms, you know. And um, and so, how do we? How how does that fit in the context of this lifetime? I started really factoring in the idea of some kind of past life PTSD, PLPTSD. That's the that's the term I've used. Many years ago, when an old client came back in for therapy, I had known her quite well. I knew her history. Uh, She'd been very forthcoming about everything, and she had had an experience over the weekend that looked so innocuous. She went to see a film. I don't want to go into a whole bunch of detail, but she'd gone to see a film, and halfway through the film, she just started sobbing hysterically and sobbing so loudly that she uh, was asked to leave the theater Hmm. because it was disturbing everybody. And she said, I just don't know what to make of it. And I sat there and thought, I don't either. And I said, so if there's something we haven't covered, you know, when you were a kid, did you this, did you that? No, 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 no. And right there I thought, you know what, this has got to be related to some past life thing. She was looking at an image on a screen and summoning something And she was reacting in no way that made any current life sense to her. And I believed her. I absolutely believed her. And that's what plugged me into to take another look at this past life material. And, of course, I've done it in my own chart. And one of the things you can do with evolutionary astrology is see certain default positions that you go to because they are familiar to you from another time. Other times, we never know if it's 1 or 5 or 25, you know. And when you when you see yourself, or I can say when I see myself sliding into that default position, I've got to yank myself back and say, no, I'm working on this now. I have to go here. I have to stretch myself here. And it's surprisingly difficult. But it, it helps with the therapeutic work. It helps with the astrological work because it's uncomfortable to stretch into this next newer evolutionary state of being that we're trying mm-hmm. to get to. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what strikes me about what you said is, well, you've probably heard this, Jung said that the wealth of the soul exists in images. And so it's just so interesting to realize or understand, as you very quickly and correctly identified, I'm sure, that it was this image on the screen in the movie theater that actually did, you know, initiated something for her, um, brought something up for her that needed to be addressed in this lifetime so that she could work through it or find some closure. And even if she, you know, whether you believe in past lives or you don't or whatever that is, it, I think the important thing is that engagement with the images. So if indeed there is some kind of trauma associated with that that image is bringing up, it needs to be worked through. And even if you don't understand and can't articulate with our new 
brains that are capable of thinking rationally, just engaging with that either on a somatic level or through mm-hmm. some kind of psychotherapeutic practice, uh, through art therapy, through movement, whatever it is, enables that to then be maybe not completely resolved, but certainly worked through and, and mitigated on some level. Well, it, it, you said it just beautifully and perfectly. And if, if I mean, I, I can't prove that past lives exist. I, I don't make any pretense to being able to prove that. I've got some very strong intuitive sense that it's so. There's a lot of life experience I've had that has said, oh, come on, absolutely, it has to be so. But at, pursuant to what you just said, if we took any kind of past life image or imagining or any story I give someone, because I always frame it as it would be, you know, if I'm looking at, it's, let's say if I were looking at your past lives in, in, in your chart, and I'd say, well, let us imagine a story wherein you this, 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 and this. Let's just imagine that as a story from another time. And that either resonates with you or it doesn't, number one. But if you didn't believe in past lives, and, and that would be quite fine, I could say, well, what if this were a dream you were having? It were images mm-hmm. in a dream you were having. Let's work with it as a dream then. Does yeah, it that's resonate great, with you that way? Great. Yes. Yeah, because again, that brings us back to the power of the images and and our relationships yeah. with them and to them, which is what Jung was so adept at, and also Hillman as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, Hadley, I, I'm so sad to say that our time is coming to an end. It's been just such a rich and very exhilarating conversation. I'm so excited to have your book, Images of Soul: Reimagining Astrology. And, of course, everybody can find out more about Hadley on her website at HadleyFitzgerald.com. That's H-A-D-L-E-Y, Fitzgerald.com. And, Hadley, I know that you are also active on social media as well. Fairly active. (laughs) That's a whole new ballgame for me. (laughs) People can find you on social media as well. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's fantastic. Well, thank you again so much for all of your insights and your stories, and I really look forward to continuing to immerse myself in this field and to understand more and more about the convergence of astrology and psychotherapy. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Bonnie. It was a great pleasure. It was just great fun talking to you. Thank you so much.